Stanford University. This is a great pleasure and an honor to be here today. Markus, thank you very much, and Songkil. Uh, and thank you again for this wonderful cruise yesterday, which I think was really outstanding. <clears throat> I am from Helmholtz Centrum Berlin, and you know this because I'm in the same institute led by Alexander, who is still having breakfast. OK. <laughs> um, my presentation on molecular dynamics is divided into three parts, where the first will be about what are we talking about in some fundamentals. The second will be about a brutal change in a chemical system. And the third will be about a more subtle change. And I want to sensitize you to what we need in order to see those, to detect those differences. <clears throat> First of all, um, I would like to know who is working in molecular dynamics, molecular physics, physical chemistry. Uh -huh. Who is working in solid state, on solid state aspects, interfaces, crystallography, proteins? They haven't come. OK. <laughs> they might come later. Good. So that's, that, that's actually a good, uh, a good start. That um, tells me that I can actually start with this. And I will do the motivation on why we're interested in molecular dynamics very short. We don't have quick time on this computer. This is why this and this movie don't run. Uh, but I guess you could imagine what happens. Atoms are moving around. And this is what we actually want to see. Because we would like to know where does selectivity in chemistry comes from, how um, <clears throat> about ground state movements of atoms and molecules in, for instance, liquid water. Um, how do molecular motors, molecular machines work? And um, details of photochemistry, which is about transferring or transforming optical energy or light energy into chemical energy. And we need to resolve those movements. Otherwise, we can't answer those questions. So there is no way around Ahmed Zewail. This is why I show two slides on him, who got the Nobel Prize in 1999 in chemistry for his studies of the transition states of chemical reactions using femtosecond spectroscopy. I strongly recommend to watch this Nobel lecture and many other lectures, by the way. They're very well, very well done, I believe. Um, and this research is about femtochemistry or the atomic scale dynamics of the chemical bond using ultra-fast lasers. And the essence is actually shown on this um, poster, where you see one beam, which is traveling this way, hitting the sample, and another one, which is traveling that way. The start pulse is what we now call the pump pulse. That one initiates or triggers the reaction. And the probing pulse down here, called observation pulse, um, allows us to observe the system and to record sequences of images, ideally. We would like to see the sequence of these images, and I will show you how x-rays can help there. One of the famous examples uh, that, again, um, is discussed in these papers is the uh, dynamics of sodium iodide, uh, shown here, where um, you excite the system, and the wave packet moves back and forth, or dissociates here, and you get uh, signals that are oscillating with time, decreasing with time, and so on. So there are a few things in this slide that I want to discuss in more detail, some fundamentals, because I want you to really, I want to really make sure we're on the same page. And one is, what is this curve? And the other one is, what is this Gaussian line that we see over this Gaussian profile over there, the wave packet? So let's go into those details. Who knows what the Born-Oppenheim approximation is? Ah. Again on this side. <laughs> Who knows what the bond? What is the bond of my approximation? Uh, it's approximation that you can treat the electrons from the Right. Any other formulation? Song. He's he's going to be my partner, by the way, in case nobody else wants to say something. Song Yin from the Simone Techers Group from Desi in Hamburg. Go ahead. Uh, so what was the question? What's the bond of my? <laughs> Good start. What's the bond? What's the bond of my approximation? The reason, uh, the idea of approximation is to uh, say that the electrons move faster than the nucleus. Right. Um, but it sometimes doesn't work so nicely in some cases. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so sometimes it doesn't work so nicely. That is true indeed. In photochemistry, there are um, 
an infinite number of examples where it is violated, but we still need to introduce it to know what we're talking about. They are moving independently, electron and nuclei, and you can treat them separately. Electrons are moving faster, that's true. You can find many different formulations of this approximation in different books. And mine is here, we neglect the coupling of nuclear and electronic motion so that we can treat the motion of nuclei and electrons independently. This is very important and this is actually the, the essence. This is justified, um, as we already discussed, because the mass of the nuclei is much um, larger than the mass of the electrons, so that the nuclei appear to be fixed while electrons are moving. This is very important and this allows us to do what we call Produktansatz, which means that we're solving the Schrödinger equation of the electrons in the static potential of fixed nuclei. This is the wave function of the molecule, which we now write as the wave function of the electrons times the wave function of the nuclei. And it is, it's important to note that the wave function of the electrons depends on the, on the, on the, on the, depends on the, on the coordinates of the electrons as a variable. But we also have the distance of the nuclei, or the, or the coordinates of the nuclei in here, which now is not a variable, but a parameter. I'm, I'm coming to this. The wave function of the nuclei really depends on the, on the, on the coordinates of the nuclei as a, as a variable. So <clears throat> in addition, we need, to have, we need to introduce the adiabatic approximation, which essentially is that the electrons follow nuclear motion instantaneously. Sometimes these two approximations are mixed into one. And with this, we can solve the Schrödinger equation for the wave function of the electrons at a fixed coordinates of the nuclei repeatedly and for many different uh, nuclear positions. This is the kinetic energy, the potential energy of the electrons. For the, that's the wave function. And this is, the, this is what we're interested in. This is the eigenvalue, or this is the energy of the electrons that we want to find out. So we're doing this. We're solving the Schrödinger equation for one nuclear coordinate uh, parameter set, for another one, for many different ones. And then we're plotting the energy that we're getting versus these, parameter, uh, versus these parameters. And this is the energy potential curve. So we can draw these curves because we, we are assuming the bonn -Oppen oppenheimer approximation. And um, it is important to note that this energy potential curve corresponds to the electronic part of the total energy of the molecule, which basically is sum of kinetic and potential energy of the electrons plus the potential energy of the nuclei. Rotational and vibrational energies are missing. We'll come to that. Now, um, when we excite, when we, let's say, absorb a photon, um, now that we have the energy potential curves, what is this Gaussian profile that I talked about? For this, we need to remind ourselves about the Frank Condon principle, which states that for transitions between different states, let's call, let's call them X and A, with vibrational levels epsilon, um, the transition probability is proportional to the electronic dipole moment. This is just um, two different ways of writing it. That's the dipole um, operator a wave function of electrons in state X, wave function of electrons in state A. Remember, those are integrals. That's why I put the second version of, uh, to write this, times the Frank Condon factors. And this is an overlap integral. So you're, you're calculating the overlap of the nuclear wave function in this um, vibrational state um, epsilon and in the starting state um, zero here. And you're um, squaring the whole thing. And this then is one of the representations you can easily find in books in many books in different uh, forms, and that will allow us to understand what we're talking about here. Down here you see the potential where we start with a nuclear wave function in the, in the ground state, vibrational ground state zero, and uh, we plot the energy potential curve, again of a bound state, uh, at the same equilibrium distance, and the largest overlap between this wave function and this wave function is actually at the equilibrium distance, and this is why the zero, zero transition is strongest. This value here is the overlap integral squared, or the Frank Condon factor. Now, when we move the upper potential to the right, you can see that now the overlap of 0, 0 is getting smaller. This is why this line is smaller than here. And another one is getting stronger. This lobe here for 2, this, this positive intensity or positive amplitude here, completely <laughs> overlaps with this one. And this is why 0 to 2 is now strongest. This also explains the shape of UV absorption spectra, but it also is essential for us to understand how a wave packet comes about. This again now is a figure from Ahmed C. Weil's uh, lecture, or uh, paper on the left, where um, he plotted the ground state uh, potential, where we start, we're starting in the vibrational ground state, and now we're shining in 
a short laser pulse. Short pulses have large bandwidth, if you remember the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, um, and the laser pulse is indicated here in white. And by shining in a short pulse with a comparably large bandwidth, large compared to the vibrational, uh, to the distance of the energy splitting of the vibrational levels, we're coherently superposing various vibrational states. So this is what we're doing by exciting. And um, what is plotted here in red is um, a more sophisticated version of what usually is just drawn as a Gaussian profile. This is a wave packet, and this is the square of the overlap of these wave functions here for one time t. And if you now would, like, would let the time run, you would see how the amplitudes of these wave function here change. This load goes negative, this one goes positive, and so on, which means that the constructive interference suddenly now at a, at a later time is not here, but maybe in the middle, so that the wave packet, and even later at the right side, so that the wave packet would move back and forth. And this is exactly what you would expect for a harmonic oscillator, which is this potential. The particle is just bouncing back and forth. And it's always important to realize what we're talking about. Wave functions, that is this. Superposition squared is this one. So we're forming a nuclear wave packet, and the wave packet is evolving in time, which means the nuclei are moving. So basically, this is just a trick to describe particles that are confined in space. Um, just for those who, are, who like equations, there are not going to be many equations in my talk. There probably are some more in Michael Odelius talk, uh, who is then talking about um, the details here. I'm hoping this is not too simplistic that I'm doing here. So um, I plotted here, or I wrote down here, the superposition of plane waves, just uh, to show what I mean. These are plane waves. And uh, this is a phase factor that makes sure that this is coherently, that they are coherently superposed. We can do two things. First, we can represent a free particle. And I, I suggest to read this book because it's really nice. Um, what is shown here is the wave function, the amplitude, so not squared, for three different times, superposing 20, I believe, to remember, um, wave functions. And you can see how it's localized in space. There are still some wiggles right and left. How it changes to negative, and go, but it also moves right as time evolves. So if you squared this, you would just get positive here, positive here, positive here. The thing is moving to the right. This is nice. That's, this is our free particle. And one, one last a little detail. Um, let's look at the dissociative state, So meaning that the potential curve is not um, parabolic as here. So the particle is not confined. But except for this little well down here, um, the particle, if you put the wave packet here, would, would move to the right. Well, the wave functions for such a potential are quasi um, uh, quasi, uh, quasi um, plane waves. And you could imagine if you now shine in a, a pulse, a short pulse with a large bandwidth, you're superpo superposing these wave functions and you're getting such a wave packet so the particle will move to the right, the system is dissociating. Let's keep that in mind because um, our uh, first example will be about this. Now, with this, I believe, or I hope, Unless you still have questions, please do interrupt me. You have to somehow shout because I'm not always looking at you. Um, I hope that you can understand what usually is drawn in also scientific talks, scientific conferences, um, little movies or um, schematic uh, drawings such as this one. The pump initiates a wave packet. A part of it could bounce back and forth, and another part could just dissociate. The system is disintegrating. This is a very complicated plot, and we're coming back to it in the quiz. As I said, I have three parts in my talk, and there will be, we'll work together every 20 minutes approximately after each part, and we're going to talk about this in detail. Reaction coordinate for a diatomic molecule would just be the distance between the two nuclei, and this is the potential energy. Remember, sum of kinetic and potential energy of the electrons plus potential energy of the nuclei. Very briefly, I want to mention a few things. Um, wh what are we interested in? As the system evolves here or here, it goes through transient configurations and it reaches intermediate states. This is the case if the potential has a well, strongly speak, uh, strictly speaking, that's larger than kT. k is the Boltzmann constant, t is temperature. And those are the important, um, the important configurations because those determine how the system will evolve. It could actually move out of the plane along a different reaction coordinate and so on. And so these are um, 
these are actually the configurations we're interested in. We want to detect those intermediate states um, in order to tell how the system actually evolves in time. One last, um, uh, one last um, little thing here. Also, in, in, in essence, the point here is the energy potential curves are what we need to know because then we need, then we know how the system behaves and what it does. So those black lines are what we need to know. And <clears throat> X-ray spectroscopy. I won't mention other techniques. Of course, you can image particles with X-rays, with electrons. You can do optical spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy, many different ways of, of, of trying to, to get those curves. And in the end, you probably have to, to combine all these informations. Um, but here we're talking about X-rays. And I'm an X-ray spectroscopist. So I want to tell you why or how X-ray spectroscopy can help. Otherwise, we'd, we'd be talking about and until tomorrow if, if we talked about all the different uh, techniques. Now, <clears throat> this is a more complicated version of what we just had. And that is something we'll have to look at um, repeatedly during, uh, during our lecture here. Again, this is potential energy or total energy of the system, the reaction coordinate. And we're starting in the green ground state. It's a bound state, vibrational ground state, if you want. And we're pumping the system to a valence excited state. So we're lifting a valence electron into, a, into a, another orbital. The whole state has more energy and now wants to evolve on this dissociative state, for instance. X-ray space, so yeah. And the essential thing to, to realize is that those curves down there, and they're split by a few electron volts, are where the chemistry actually happens. And this is where the chemistry that we are interested, I'm interested, actually happens because this corresponds to the absorption of visible light, a few electron volts. You can also be interested in the chemistry that happens if you absorb 20 electron volts or 700 or something. But um, here we're talking about uh, visible excitation, visible light excitation, photochemistry that happens upon absorption of visible light. And this is also what characterizes chemical bonding down there, because those are the valence electrons. Those are the, the electrons that keep the, the, the nuclei together. So we need to actually characterize these in order to know what the system does. So that's what we're interested in. And a bit provocative from my uh, perspective, this is just the probing. Those curves up there, you see that the line is broken here, are very far away. And we heard the, the numbers, 280 for carbon, 400 EV for nitrogen, 500 for oxygen, and so on. So those curves are very far away. Those are core excited states. Um, different core excited states, one or two here, different chemical species. This is the chemical shift that Alexander talked about yesterday. The splitting typically is in the order of 5 to 10 electron volts. And um, that tells us also about the, the, the spectral resolution that we need in our probe in order to resolve those differences. And that's what we're actually doing. Remember, again, this little wave packet. It's moving on this curve at a certain time delay. This is pump, this is probe. We're probing where it is. And the first example will be um, where we actually don't generate co-excited states, but we generate a valence ionized state, which means we're just ionizing the system. We're just taking out the valence electrons to see what, how the electronic structure has evolved. Before we come to this first part, let's um, talk about a few things here. I sneaked in this or similar drawings. So who can tell me how many drawings are in this drawing? <laughs> Strictly, <laughs> for instance, <laughs> strictly speaking, you would have to draw several drawings into, in order to represent the same thing. How many would I have to draw? Any idea? So? <laughs> Counting. How many do you see? Tell me the ones you see, and then we just count. Any idea? Five. Why five? Start somewhere. Tell me what you see. What's the first information contained in this figure? Five curves. Right. <clears throat> five curves. Let's categorize. This curve is a nuclear wave function. This is a nuclear wave function, this one as well, this one as well. That's one information. Good. So we have nu nuclear wave functions. What else do we have? The energy levels. Two. What else do we have? Potential. Say it again, please. The potential. Right. 
So we have three drawings in one, and this is something you should remember whenever you see these drawings. And this is actually really tough. Um, first, you have the shape of the harmonic potential. That's the dashed curve, and that's what you meant with different y-axis. So V is for the potential. Second, we have the energy levels of the harmonic oscillator. These are the horizontal lines here. And third, we have the nuclear wave functions plotted versus x, where the y-axis now suddenly is another one. And this is very important to realize because it's putting many things into one and it's really complicated. Those figures are really complicated. Don't forget that. That's the message. So what is wrong in this one? Aha, uh -huh. why is that wrong? Because the energy totality should be the same. Correct. This is actually a coupling of electronic and nuclear motions that I'm showing here, but that's not allowed in this strict von Oppenheim approximation that I'm plotting here. You're right, the wave function should actually go back and forth, and this one should just move out like this, if at all you want to show movements, which is also at the limit. Very good. If anybody has a question or didn't get that, why should it just keep going straight? Why can't it speed up? As because what we're plotting here is um, this, the speeding up going down would mean that you're coupling electronic and nuclear motions. As nuclei move, energy of the system changes. But strictly speaking, this is not included in this figure. Kinetic energy of the nuclei, the speeding up, is not in here. Vibrations also isn't. This is just the potential energy of the nuclei, but it's not the kinetic energy of the nuclei. You can, you can interpret it that way, but you know, this is maybe semantics, so don't, don't create a, a dilemma out of it. Um, this is just to, 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 re, to sensitize you that what the power of these graphs is and what you shouldn't use them for. This is illustration. What really counts in the end is the shape of those curves and what happens if the curves, if the curves cross. That's where the coupling is of nuclear and electronic motion and that's actually what really matters. This is the illustration. Now, do you have any idea how to determine what time resolution we need in order to resolve molecular motion? How should we do that? Uh, 150 seconds, I want. Why? Um, if you consider uh, the fastest speed in the material is the sound of uh, the sound. Speed of sound, good. And depending on the material, yep. you, you end up something like, uh, okay, let's say 300 milli, uh, millimeters per second, so around 350 seconds per, per uh, 300 angstrom per 20 seconds. The calculation will come in a second. Good point. Uh, did everybody understood that or was that loud enough? Okay. What else can we do to estimate the time resolution we need to resolve molecular motion? There are two classical ways, if you want. One is the speed of sound, which is just you know, particles moving. Vibrational frequencies. Aha. Uh -huh. You also have that? Yeah. Good. So how do you do that? Can you? So you just take a vibrational spectrum and measure right. how long it takes your bond to oscillate. Something. Exactly. So those two calculations are shown here. Take the oscillation period of a molecule. That's what you just said. For example, OH stretch vibration, 3,500 wave numbers, wavelength is three microns, and with these little formula, um, period is one over frequency, speed of light is wavelength times frequency. You can get this, three to minus six, three times 10 to minus six, divided by three times 10 to minus uh, to eight, speed of, uh, speed of light, and you calculate 10 femtoseconds for one oscillation period. So in order to resolve this, if you want, you need femtosecond time resolution, 10 femtosecond time resolution. Song's approach was to take the speed of sound, um, which is several hundred to 1,000 meters per second, and this corresponds to, that's what you try to do, Song, 0.1 to 1 angstrom per 100 femtoseconds. And if you remember that the bond length of typical molecules is in the angstrom range, to see them falling apart, we need this time resolution. Good. How fast do the electrons actually move? Well, there are experiments in the, from Munich guys, they show that it's in the 
uh, low up to second degree. Right. But uh, it depends also on the system. If you have a very heavy nucleus, it can also be faster. Uh -huh. I think you should think about why do you actually care? Do we care if we look at molecular motions, how fast the electrons are moving? Well, basically, one should care because the chemical, is, uh, or the chemical bonding is coming from the electrons. Yes. So that gives us a lower limit of the resolution of the lower limit we need to see the chemical reactions happening. So should we do molecular dynamics with attosecond resolution then? Well, so far, no, no. Is that necessarily needed? Why not? Because most of the time it keeps uh, so, uh, so, uh, the chemical reactions happening in the femtosecond range. The nuclei are moving on the femtosecond yeah. range. Exactly. And um, this is again just a question, a provocative question to sensitize you. Ask yourself, why do I actually care? And um, do I want to see electron motion? Then yes, you, you, the classically the electron takes 150 attoseconds to circulate the proton. Uh, so I need auto second time resolution. But if you want to see the rearrangements of electrons while nuclei are moving, femtoseconds is good enough. Whether von Oppenheim approximation is valid or not is another question. But what we're talking about here is the femtosecond range because we want to see how nuclei are moving. This is the chemistry. And we want to see how electrons, that's why X-ray spectroscopy, are rearranging while these nuclei are moving. Okay. Last question about this quiz, what do you see? Let's collect a few answers here. Markus. Christmas Eve peak decoration. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. Molecular dynamic simulations. Molecular dynamic simulations. That also is a good answer. Water. Say it again. Water. Good. You're interpreting the movie. This is actually ethanol. But you know, if you look closely. Bond breaking, aha. Uh -huh. We see an, an event, we see a chemical reaction here. I think this is actually the scale. Say it again. This is actually a femtochemical reaction. You ah, initiated okay. the cyst, that's why bond break. But you're right, I mean, this is not shown here. We don't show the pump pulse and so on. But this was actually excited, and this is iron. This is supposed to represent iron. This is supposed to be a CO molecule, and this one pops off after exciting the system. Yes, so we actually had the whole spectrum of answers. There could have been one in between the more scientific and yours, which also is as scientific, <laughs> don't, don't misunderstand me, which would have been just balls, colored balls, right? So I like those answers because we should re always remember what we see and what we're looking at. So this is an MD simulation, molecular dynamics simulation, um, done by Michael Odelius, uh, the, the, the next speaker. And it's actually one of the systems I will discuss briefly at the end, the dissociation reaction of iron pentacarbonyl, iron penta 5 carbonyl COs in ethanol. So beyond this very uh, simple question now is, or behind it is, where are the electrons? We can't see them. Aha. What do we see, actually? Nuclear motion. Right. Those are the colored balls. And then you saw that event, that bond breaking event here. There must be electrons. You, you see uh, molecular orbitals represented or like bonds. Yes. There are the electrons, but you don't really see the electrons. Yes. Isn't that a, exactly? Isn't that a very simplistic representation of a chemical bond? Exactly. It's a colored bar that changes color in between somewhere. And at some arbitrary distance, vanishes. Of course, you're right. This is very simplistic. And what, what we're talking about here is to resolve, ah, now it's gone, to resolve the, the, the rearrangements of the electrons while such bond breaking events happen in order to actually determine how it really happens, because this is where the details are. Yes, very good. Let me check the time. OK, perfect in time. So with this, we come to the second part. <clears throat> the second part now is a scientific, or let's say an example, uh, based on our own research. But as I said before, I could have taken many other examples, and there are many of them. And yeah, So this is about uh, this very brutal change that I talked about. 
this uh, gentleman here wonders how the elephant fell down the gallery and um, for whatever reason he would like to know, but you know, maybe to prevent it next time. And certainly movies help here because you could resolve the motion of the elephant, resolve intermediate states, the, the, apparently he's very you know, hungry and wants this carrot, which maybe is the reason why he fell. Not necessarily though, your expectation agrees with the result, but that's one of the things we're discussing here. By the way, this is a little sidekick on Majet Chagui, um, a very influential person in that field, who usually shows a cat falling down that always lands on its feet. And I could also have shown the horse, where the question is how many you know, feet are, um, is always one foot on the ground or not, which was taken not far from here, I believe, um, by Mybridge. <clears throat> so let's talk about this. And the example I want to discuss is the dissociation of a diatomic molecule. This is a brutal change. Two nuclei are falling apart. We recognize again this little rod that somehow vanishes at some point, some arbitrary distance in time or distance. And you, assume, you of course, what's behind is orbitals that evolve in time which then all end up to the valence electronic structure, a spectrum if you want, and that's what we want to measure. So let's go into detail in order to understand this example. So what the, the idea is to see this wave packet moving in time. We pump the system, it dissociates, to see how nuclei are moving apart, and to actually follow how the electronic structure changes as a function of time. You recognize this little uh, cartoon, probably most of you have, have dealt with H2 plus or H2 molecular orbital theory, how to build molecular orbitals and so on. So let's do that because for bromine, because we need to understand that in order to understand our spectrum. I plot here bromine for P um, energy levels, six ele uh, five electrons each. The, the, uh, the configuration is bromine 4P5, and those are the molecular orbitals that are forming if you move those nuclei together. Those are just the valence electrons. They have a certain symmetry, sigma or pi symmetry. Um, they are all, um, occupied bonding ones, unoccupied antibonding, and uh, occupied antibonding, and unoccupied antibonding ones. We, we'll go into detail later. Now, this is very convenient, such a representation, because with this we can understand what we expect if we now measure the valence electron spectrum. Um, this was uh, probably mentioned many times, latest um, in Alexander Föhlich's um, talk, UPS ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy, valence band photoelectron spectroscopy, whatever you call it, you just put in 20 electron volt photons and rip out the valence electrons, those here, to probe where they are basically. This is what we're doing. We're drawing a vacuum level. We're shining in photons with an energy larger than 15 eV, promoting this electron to the vacuum. And by measuring its kinetic energy, we know where it actually was sitting before we started measuring. So we're probing the valence electronic structure. That's convenient. It's not yet X-rays, but we're coming there. Binding energy is just photon energy minus kinetic energy. So plotting this uh, differently, again, those three uh, occupied levels, we can expect three lines and we'll just call them X, A and B for the moment. Three lines corresponding to the three final ionic states of this system. In the quiz, we'll talk more about this diagram for those who, who, um, who get nervous, like Peter, for instance. And you know why, maybe. Um, this is the measured intensity as a function of binding energy. And you see the three lines, X, A and B. And you can start thinking why that, that's not a single line. We'll talk about that later. Remember that, as we expect. <clears throat> so those are four spectra for four different delays. Minus delay means probe becomes, uh, comes before pump, which means we haven't initiated anything. So that's our ground state spectrum. And then you see tiny little changes. You see something appearing with time here. Blue is the latest delay. Black, red, green, blue. Something is coming up here. This is decreasing here and something very small is happening here. So if we zoom in there, oh no, we don't do that for, for the moment. First, we talk about again this total energy um, diagram that we have here, the energy potential curves, because so those are calculated from Michael Odelius actually, who also did the calculations here. The ground state in blue, dissociative state in red, and one of the final ionic states corresponding to the X state in green. That's what we're doing. We're promoting the wave packet to this dissociative state. Uh, careful, it dissociates and we're probing at, at, at a certain time delay, which means we're shining in a photon. It's broken up here because the energy is higher than the length of the arrow uh, into a continuum. And we're actually, this is the kinetic energy we're measuring for two different time delays. 
oops, and if you carefully look, what we're actually measuring is the distance between this and that curve. And this distance changes as a function of time. It's small here, and it's getting larger, and at some point it's just constant. This is our experimental observable. Now, why don't we see lines moving through our spectrum then? We'll come to this. What we see is increasing intensity. Those effects are very small. And I just have a zoom here into this region, where you see now this increasing intensity. Blue is out of the range in this region here. And then there is another region around 15.2, which is here, where you also see a little increase of intensity. Yes, Song? Question. Uh, on the big X, yes. why is it that, uh, for the negative time, uh, the two squares doesn't overlap? You mean the decrease here? Yeah. Why is that so? Good question. Anybody has an idea? Ensemble is the solution. We have an ensemble of molecules. We're pumping a certain fraction. Say it again. We don't excite all, we just excite a, we excite a fraction. Like small exactly. So what we see here in blue is the remaining fraction that we don't excite, and the rest is gone and appears here. It has to, it's ground state bleach, usually gone. Oh. Black and a curve, which uh, represent the negative time. Yes. I mean, they should overlap, right? I see. Yeah. Also a good question. Why is minus 17 not? Yeah. Because your pump pulse has a certain length. And yes. You already something. And the probe pulses where exactly? Absolutely. You have to imagine our pulses are not lines. Our pulses are pulses. They have a width. So um, if this is probe before pump, this is still negative but we are starting to excite where they already overlap. Good. Do you actually see dynamics on the negative time scale, like pro pump process? No, not in this case. In sodium iodide, yes, but not in this case. Good point. Sometimes pump probe experiments are pump probe experiments in both directions, in positive and negative, because pump and probe is just arbitrary. It could also be probe and pump. Yeah, yeah. very good. So. The problem here is you see that we have unexcited molecules, which means that we always have a certain background. This sits on a certain background of 0.5. You have a signal of 1.5. This is a huge background here where our dynamic signal sits on, so we'd like to get rid of this. And we're doing this by subtracting unexcited molecules. I'm not talking about, about how, but there is a strict uh, way of doing this. And by doing that, we get those curves, which is now different spectra. And then you also start see, so here for instance, let's, let's talk about this range here. Um, the curves now go down to zero and you see really the evolution of this spectral range as a function of time. Here also the background is gone and you can see now suddenly very small signals such as this one where um, something happens um, at minus 17 already. Now the point here is I said, I'm going to run, rush a bit through this, but we can talk about it later, because I want to actually focus on the essentials. Um, one of the points was, why don't we see lines moving through our spectrum? Um, the, the correct answer will come later. Here for the moment, I just want to tell you that we're doing the following trick. We're looking at the lowest binding energy where we have a dynamic signal. This is this range around seven electron volts here. And we're integrating the intensity in this box as a function of time, and we're getting the black dots it's a Gaussian distribution which is centered around zero. This is actually our cross correlation, basically the convolution of pump and probe. Then we're integrating intensity here in the middle, somewhere in between where we didn't see any peak. There was no peak here. And we're integrating intensity here as a function of time and we're getting a Gaussian that's shifted in time by 15 femtoseconds. Then we're looking at intensity here. <clears throat> we're getting a Gaussian again, which is shifted by 40 femtoseconds compared to zero. And we're integrating the intensity here, and we're getting this step-like function. This tells us that a state has moved through the spectrum from 7.6 eV to 11.8 on this time scale of 90 femtoseconds. Intensity has started here and has moved through the spectrum to rise as a step-like function. Here it came and went, here it came and went, here it came and went, and here it just came and stayed. And this is what we then extract 
As a function of delay, which we correlate with distance based on the calculations, we plot binding energies, this will come in a second, and every point here corresponds to one of these pairs of binding energy and time, and show how states from the excited molecule evolve towards the states of the free atom. This is just multiplets of the free atom, and this is a notation for the excited states of the intact molecule. Okay, and you see how states are moving from left to right, how others are moving from right to left to reach those atomic positions. And we compare these two calculations from Mikhail, and it agrees. We see how all those different states in the molecule move through the spectrum. We don't see them as lines because our time resolution is not good enough. Careful, we'll come to this detail in a second. But we, we can still extract that dynamics. This is nice because it shows how, when probed by valence photoelectron spectroscopy, Valence electrons are rearranging as the molecules, as the nuclei are moving apart, okay? Just a little detail. Remember that there are different uh, orbital symmetries. Sigma orbitals are oriented along the bond, which means the nodal plane is, is perpendicular to the, to the nu nuclear axis, to the molecular axis. Pi orbitals are um, ones where the nodal plane contains the nuclear axis, and it looks like sigma orbitals are um, shifting, or peaks that correspond to sigma orbitals are shifting more than the pi orbitals, simply because they are oriented along the bond. It takes them longer to actually realize the other, nuclei, the, the other nucleus has gone. Just a little detail on the side. We can discuss if you want later. Now, actually, this is not honest, this comparison. The experiment was done with 60 femtosecond pump pulses and 120 femtosecond probe pulses. And this is um, Fourier transform limited pulses, which means 20 femtosecond probe pulses. This is what we actually measured. Everything is spread along the delay because this is actually what represents now the calculation for the time resolution we have overlaid experiment and theory. And I just want to um, outline one thing. If you do a cut, at a certain delay, you get a spectrum. And by doing cuts at different delays, you can actually follow how the spectrum changes. And this is just shown for this uh, triplet P region for the atomic states here. And you see how this broad distribution corresponding to those A prime, B prime states in the molecule evolves as a function of time towards the atomic spectrum in calculations and experiments. The details are not correct, but uh, qualitatively agrees. If you let just look at a certain binding energy and follow the delay, you can get what, what I call a delay scan. You basically follow intensity as a function of time at a certain binding energy. And here I put it on this atomic peak, which is this singlet D2 uh, peak, and I just follow how long does it take for the atomic intensity to arise. And this is this green curve. A fit here with the experimental data, those are the triangles. And this is a step function. So at some point, the atomic intensity has, has, um, has arisen, if you want, or um, um, is evolved. And you expect a step function, actually, where the step tells you now it's atomic. And uh, the step function is convoluted by the time resolution of our experiment, because we have a certain time resolution, which in this case is 135 femtoseconds. Now, um, if you just look at this curve, it's normalized to 1. It starts at 0. The, the, the point in time where it, where it rises to half of the height could, call, could be called a dissociation time. And we'll talk about this in a minute from, from further. So that means here, at a distance of 3.8 angstroms, or after 85 femtoseconds, the atomic intensity is established, the molecule is, in a, is disintegrated, and we have atomic peaks, so it's atoms. This is the, disso the dissociation time. Now, the problem is if I plot this intense, if I plot this dissociation time for our experiment, as I said, we get this 85 femtoseconds here, and a distance of 3.8. Common sense, if you want, or what you often read in chemistry books, is twice the equilibrium distance, then the molecule is broken apart, would be 4.6, 120, not so far away. Laser femtochemistry, which is experiments of the type of Ahmed Sewail has not been done for bromine, but could be estimated to be at 140 to 200. And then there are two more experiments from um, Hans Jakob Werner, who is now in Zurich, and Captain Mernin Group in Boulder, Colorado, uh, who determined larger times and much larger distances. And the question is why. We'll talk about this in a second. 
So I rushed through this experiment because I wanted to arrive at the quiz part because there are some interesting questions we could discuss. First of all, which one applies, which one is correct, is one of them wrong? Let's detect the differences and the common features. What do they have in common? What is different? Any idea? What's on the x-axis? For bromine. Let's talk about it for bromine. Tom? The nuclear distance. Nuclear distance. In both cases, right? Uh, Somehow. You can say that on the left peak, you, you, uh, you see uh, this, the electronic um, uh, changes as, as a molecule, which mm -hmm. you don't, the information you don't have in the left picture, where you see only the potential and complete potential energy yes. surfaces. Right. That's one way of saying it, yes. So in a, in a sense, nuclear distance is also included here. This is the equilibrium bonding distance, and these are the free atoms, right? This is why I drew these little arrows, and delta t is a function of time. In the right-hand side, can you use time, or is it an eigenstate representation? Uh -huh. Yeah, we're coming closer. Good question. I don't think you can actually include time, but here's another opinion. I think in the right, right one we see electronic states. Yes. In electronic states, and in the left one we see a molecular state. Yeah. You have an opinion? Um, on, the, on the right one, you don't have a change in nuclear distance, whereas in the experiment, in the left one, you have. In, on the right, you just have two nuclear distances if you want infinite and bonding. You're right. You don't see really. This is not a. Uh, 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 this is not the real evolution here. Yes. Um, so the point was really molecular states, electronic states. What what does that mean? Because I think this is what's behind this representation of the problem that we're having. On the right, we plot orbital energies. This is a single electron orbital picture, and this is a total electron, a many electron total en energy picture. You can use both for illustrative purposes, but strictly speaking, this is the one you should really use to discuss your problem, because that's the one that's strictly correct. This one sometimes leads you on wrong path, but it can be used to, um, as I did also, to um, get out a feeling here for certain things. But there's more to it. Using Koopman's theorem, you can also correlate this orbital energy with binding energy. And Koopman's theorem say, says the first ionization energy of a molecular system is equal to the negative of the orbital energy of the highest occupied orbital. Alexander discussed this yesterday. And that's the connection of the two. But again, I just wanted to sensitize you. Sometimes be careful with these single electron pictures because they, they can lead you on the wrong path. In essence, you just have to know what you're looking at. There is more to it now. I wanted to come to this. <clears throat> Why are those times or distances so different in those different experiments? Any idea? Did we or the others do something wrong, or could there be other reasons? So. I mean, um, nothing wrong, just you have to cope a certain, uh, I mean, you have the model of your, of your, of your uh, molecule or experiment, and you cope a certain so characteristic of these. Correct. So they have different sensitivity to Exactly. Is that what you wanted to say or you wanted to add something? Good. Yeah, exactly. We're probing different things and we should always remember what we're probing and I'm coming to this in detail. So just to remind you, here we're probing the electronic structure. This is common sense. This is dissociative state um, potential energy are coming to this and this is electronic structure. Now the question remains, why are these different from ours? We'll come to that. First of all, does the temporal resolution that we have in our experiment, let's talk about our photoelectron experiment, photoelectron spectroscopy experiment. Does the temporal resolution we have, 60 femtosecond pump, 120 femtosecond probe, which is convoluted 135 femtoseconds, does the temporal re um, resolution affect the determination of the dissociation time? It's not so easy, but just guess. Do, do you think that if I probe this with a better time resolution, I would determine the same rise of the atomic peak, half height, or would I detect it at a different time? 
I'm not sure whether this plays a role, but um, if you look at if you look with a really high resolution, you might actually see the events where they dissociate and quickly um, reassociate. Aha. Uh -huh. Good point. This is not the case for bromine. We're in the gas phase, and there's so much so much excess energy in the system, it just flies apart. Yes, that's a good point. So as soon as you put this in solution or in some matrix, you would have to deal with geminate recombination. The thing recombines. Many other things could happen. And then certainly, higher selectivity with better time resolution will tell you more and allow you to better determine the dissociation time. But just a guess. Do you think the temporal resolution affects the determination of the dissociation time? And how would you actually estimate this? Maybe if I show you this. Again, the white dots are experiment, and the colored um, smeared lines are um, calculations from Michael, now shown for three different probe pulse length. Pump is always the same. And here we have 120 femtoseconds probe pulses, 60 femtosecond probe pulses, and 20 femtosecond probe pulses. So what are we doing, actually? If you look at the curves, we're smearing out, and we're smearing out along the vertical. So let's have a look at this one line, singlet D here, and just calculate the step function as for the three different pulse lengths. And you can see those here for 20, 60, and 120. And 120 is less steep, and 20 femtoseconds is the steepest, sure, because that's the highest time resolution. And you see there's a little difference. If I just draw a line at 0.5, there's a little difference but it's much smaller than the dissociation time we have at 85 femtoseconds. So yes, it does affect, but the difference is small. Does the spectral resolution affect the determination of our dissociation time? What does the spectral resolution do? What does the spectral resolution do? Think about the smearing. Yeah, yeah? Accurate, but can you the binding energy? Yeah, so if you think about smearing, we're smearing along the horizontal. This is the binding energy. So that, that, that's what you did. And that's, that's, the, that's the clue. We're smearing those intensities along this direction. If we have worse spectral resolution, we're smearing those traces along this. And now imagine again this one you wouldn't be able to resolve the single Aha. signals in the different states Good. when you have too bad resolution. Exactly. So let's assume our spectral resolution is good enough to distinguish this one from this one and this one's. But still, it would change a little bit. So if you want, it would change in that range. So yes, you need to distinguish the different states, correct? But then we're smearing here a little bit. Would that affect the determination of the dissociate of what I call dissociation time? No. I think so too. It wouldn't. Unless we don't resolve the states anymore. And this is actually again, yes, please. Doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 okay, how? Because what what you're calling dissociated is your ability to say that is a binding energy that is associated with the free atom. Mm -hmm. So you have to distinguish energetically between states, yes. between configurations of atoms. If, the, if your ability to distinguish changes, then in principle, I suspect you'd say it would look atomic sooner. I believe. It would be subtle, but it's, I mean, if it has a subtle effect in time, then it has to have a subtle effect from energy. But isn't that what she meant? If your spectral resolution is so bad that you're starting to mix these, then yes, you're no, right. No, I'm just saying that you have... OK, so take the part that starts from the lowest binding energy and this then one? slides into, I don't remember what your labels were. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what are you saying is, when do you say it's dissociated? It's when you've got that line of vertical dots. Correct. When do you start seeing a line of vertical dots? If your resolution is only 4 EV. Yeah. I believe, I will do the, ex the exercise actually, but I believe it, it, it occurs at, at spectral resolutions that are so bad that you don't distinguish states anymore. But let me do the exercise. I think the key point is here, or this is signal to noise, 
Also, yes. If you have also, that, to noise, sure. Noise you can always deconvolute. You can distinguish extremely sure. small features. Correct. I mean, that's also the argument for your time. Correct. But with a realistic signal to noise, it becomes impossible. Correct. That is anyway a, uh, always an issue. Yes, what, what signal to noise do we have? Um, I wanted to come to this, to this graph again, the total energy picture, because I think with this, we can maybe um, grasp it. So a bad time resolution, or let's say a varying time resolution, what does it correspond to in this figure? How would you represent 120, 60, and 20 femtosecond time resolution? Graphically, if you had to show this, if you had to illustrate this, how would you do that? Yes? The broadness of the wave packet? The broadness of the wave packet, I believe, deter is, de is determined by the length of your pump pulse. Let's, let's keep the pump pulse constant and let's vary the probe pulse. There is a the smoothness of your curves. I mean, they would the curves are as calculated. But you would only see stepwise changes. How would you illustrate this? Well, by making really. Uh, Right, you can't connect dots anymore and you don't have, you, you don't know where you are so exactly. What does that mean? Look at this line. You don't have, I mean, you get broader bands in the end. I mean, uh, yes, just, that's, that's what comes out in the end, but oh, I'm sorry, there is a, yeah? Broad error? Yes, the width of the arrow, exactly. A broad arrow would mean long pulses and a, and a, and a thin arrow would mean short pulses. And then what you, what you described comes out, correct. Uh, spectral resolution means the length of the arrow is not clearly defined. That could be illustrated by, by, by drawing instead of a line, having a bar, uh, uh, let, let's say a, a band over there, okay? And I think because this green curve is not symmetric around this arrow, it's different here than there, that explains why those step functions were at slightly different positions depending on the width of that line, depending on the length of the propulse. Again, um, this little uh, cartoon, and I estimated this time and distance here by, by um, let's say, doing a Duncan experiment, experiment based on one of those um, experiments from Seawile. Um, for a different molecule, ICN now, or actually a schematic molecule. You promote the wave packet, it evolves, and then what, what is done here, you're shining in a second um, frequency or wavelength laser, a different wavelength, and you're probing, and you're actually promoting or exciting from this dissociative curve to an imaginary um, third energy potential curve. And what is measured in these experiments is actually the distance between this and that curve, very similar to us. It's actually exactly the same thing. It's just a different uh, way of probing, and they also get step functions that are convoluted by the time resolution and those Gaussians that are moving in time. So there is no real difference here. Um, ah, yeah. I wanted to just close on what we discussed before. We're probing different things, and just to tell you, um, we do measure this 85 femtoseconds for the time when the atomic line, in this case tri uh, triplet P, but it's the same for the singlet D line, has appeared. But we're seeing very small shifts of that line out to 300 femtoseconds. It is an atomic line, and suddenly the whole thing becomes semantic. Because of course the chemical bond is not something that just is a bar that breaks. That's why also this 85 is a bit fishy. Uh, in the end, what you have, you could call this is a, a dissociation time, but um, you always should talk about what are you probing. We are probing photoelectron lines of atoms. They are established after roughly 85 femtoseconds, but they still shift on a much longer time scale, which corresponds very well with this experiment, for instance. And now it becomes uh, uh, um, an, an, uh, a current problem because we're still discussing what are we probing with this technique, with this technique, compared to this technique. And that's not finished yet. Um, what time resolution do we actually need? Imagine we would like to be better than this because these are still not really nice lines. If you draw a line here to get a spectrum, imagine you would see this intensity being spread if you do it at 50 femtoseconds 
rising and going down over 2 EV or something. Pretty broad. Would a femtosecond be good? Remember, this is the, the, the connection of um, temporal um, um, width and uh, spectral width. Um, in femtoseconds, full width times EV gives you 1.85 EV femtoseconds. So the question to you is, should we use one femtosecond pulses to do this experiment? Calculated. What's the spectral width of a one femtosecond pulse? 1.85. Say again? We lose the energy. Exactly. So in the end, um, even also auto seconds don't help. Here is just a trace again for this singlet D line here. Basically just spectra cuts at different delays for these three different cases. This is what we measured, 120 femtoseconds. You see how this intensity go, um, goes down, this one evolves, and the line here just goes up and down as a function of time. And even at Fourier transform limited pulses, 20 femtoseconds, 0.1 electron volts bandwidth, you don't see a line moving through, but you just see the shape changes, changing as a function of time. So this is the best we can actually expect. And this is, um, yeah. So in the end, we need 30 femtosecond time resolution, let's say, um, available at any time. And routinely, that's the big challenge for, for FELs. Um, and in the, in, the, in, the, in the laser lab, it's not so hard to do. And um, yeah, one little note now again, is bromine a particularly bad example? No, it's actually a particularly good example because those atoms are heavy. And you see the formula up here. Um, the, 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 the acceleration is given by the steepness of the potential and the mass of the nuclei, or yeah, mass of the nuclei. A is steepness of the potential divided by the mass. If you were looking at even lighter atoms, this would actually be even faster. And um, that uh, is also the case for ICN. We always have a similar steepness from four to three electron volts. Here it's from three to zero electron volts approximately. So um, the speed at which these atoms uh, would fly apart um, is actually um, higher if you look at lighter elements. And this tells you it's going to be very hard to follow those lines, to follow the electronic structure if your time resolution is not optimal. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.